Hello everyone, this is Simon Turpin from Answers in Genesis in the UK and welcome to our Friday evening session, well at least it's uh, evening for me here in the UK at 7.30 but with our guest tonight it's um, one just after one o'clock there in Texas for the Dr Douglas Petrovich but wherever you are uh, watching us from in the world today um, we're glad to have you with us and tonight we're going to be looking at a fascinating topic the issue of the exodus from Egypt. And we have a guest with us who's one of the leading experts in the world on this, Dr. Douglas Petrovich. I'm gonna introduce him in a second while we wait for people on the different streaming channels we're broadcasting on to join us. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, and we're live on Answers TV. And so wherever you're joining from, uh, we are glad to have you with us. So we're gonna be talking tonight about the evidence for the ex Exodus. And I do have with me um, Dr. Douglas Petrovich. Dr. Petrovich is not only a biblical scholar, but he has a, a PhD in archeology span from Toronto University in Canada. He um, is professor of biblical history and exegesis at the Bible Seminary in Texas. And he's authored two books. In 2016, he wrote the world's oldest alphabet Hebrew as the language of the proto-consonantal script. And I believe he's just about to have another book released, Origins of the Hebrews, New Evidence for Israelites in Egypt from Joseph to the Exodus. So I believe tonight we're going to be looking at some of that exciting new evidence. So Dr. Petrovich, good to have you with us this evening. Thank you, Simon. It's great to be with you and with all of your listeners and viewers. Would you just like to, to tell us about this new book that you have coming out? Sure. Uh, Origins of the Hebrews. It's a book I've been working on since 2012. I actually paused to write my what became my first book uh, during that process. And that one, as you mentioned, was published at the end of 2016. Um, this book essentially provides the greater context and it's more of, of an overview, looking at all of the lines of evidence for uh, the Israelites living in Egypt uh, for that 430 year period that Exodus 12, 40 and 41 talks about uh, from the entry of Jacob and his family in 1876 BC, as we know from biblical chronology, all the way to 1446 BC, um, that period of 430 years. So it's the book looks into um, um, epigraphical evidence, writings from ancient inscriptions, and of course, um, the Middle Egyptian language, which is hieroglyphic uh, Egyptian, is the first minor of my PhD. Actually, it's it's more than just Middle Egyptian, but Middle Egyptian was the focus. Um, and uh, so the book includes um, this inscriptional evidence. It includes iconog iconographical evidence that's evidence from drawings and paintings and, and uh, representations of things, as well as um, archeological evidence. So looking at uh, ceramics and, and other things. So it's a pretty holistic approach. Um, the book is, um, let's see, it's going to be probably around 300 or so pages in length. Um, and again, it took uh, since 2012 to write. Wow. So, well, we look forward to that book coming out. And I know we're going to look at some of the evidence from that book um, tonight. But I'll, I'm going to ask a few questions. For those that are watching, I'm going to ask Dr. Petrovich a number of questions. And then if you have a question for Dr. Petrovich, hopefully we'll be able to get to that at the end. Um, if you're not familiar, for those who are watching, with the issue of the Exodus and is there evidence for the Exodus, isn't there evidence for the Exodus? Some people believe it was a myth. Some people think there is no evidence for it, but we're going to look tonight at the evidence. But Dr. Petrovich, with for Christians, at least in academia, there's there's two competing dates um, for the Exodus. There's a late date um, and an early date, but many of our viewers tonight may not have any familiarity with that. Can you explain the difference in these dates and why people come to different conclusions? Sure. So to do this, I'm going to pop on a slideshow that, so that you can follow along a little bit with what I'm saying so that it's right. not so difficult um, just to hear it. Um, so there are two views, two main views for the Exodus, for the date of the Exodus at least. Uh, one is called the early Exodus view by most people. The other is called the late Exodus view by most people. Um, and first I want to talk to you about the early Exodus view. And that's the view that I hold, that it was the middle of the 15th century BC when the Exodus happened. 
Uh, and the exact year for me, of course, is 1446. So what is our evidence for, and, and this essentially Simon is going to cover a little bit what we were going to look at with a further question, but what is the evidence for the early Exodus view? Um, why do we have an early Exodus view? How do we get there? So that's what we want to talk about first. Well, obviously it's best to start with the biblical text itself. And the passage that's known as the uh, key passage for all of Old Testament chronology is 1 Kings 6.1. This verse connects the Exodus to later Israelite history by noting that Solomon began constructing the temple of he who is, that's the, the uh, literal uh, translation, actually house of he who is, but we can say temple of he who is, that's the, the covenant name of God as translated into English, in the 480th year after the Exodus, right? So the Exodus happens and we move forward 479 plus years. And then we get to a point where Solomon and his people, his uh, construction workers begin um, constructing this temple to God, to the God of the Israelites. And that signifies, again, an elapsed time of 479 plus years. Well, if we look at Neo-Assyrian chronology, and that's really important because the Neo-Assyrians were extremely careful and methodical about um, connecting important events in their calendar to, um, um, to their dating system. And their dating system is, is one that they, um, it's called eponymic dating. And they, they essentially date um, each year according to an event, an important event that took place. For example, if in the United States, 2001 were to be given an eponymic dating term, probably most American people would call that um, the year of 9-11 or something to that effect, because that's the most important, easily the most important event of 2001. So that's the, what the Neo-Assyrians did. Well, their chronology of the first millennium BC, which is the most specific and accurate chronology that you can hope to have in antiquity, um, which dates events that are recorded in the Bible and can be identified on a timeline with absolute dates. That's what we normally think in terms of this is uh, 2021 in absolute dates. Well, we can connect events from those years of Neo, Neo, the Neo, Neo Assyrian Empire to these events that happen uh, in terms of a timeline. And this demonstrates that 966 or 967 BC is the precise year in which construction on the first temple began. And I'll just go back and mention, again, there are, there are um, events recorded in the Bible that coincide with events that show up in Neo-Assyrian records, one of which being the, um, attack, uh, the attack on Carchemish in 612 BC. So events like these can then um, tie into biblical chronology, and now we're able to to assign um, uh, specific years in, in terms of absolute numbers uh, to Israel's um, ancient history, to their chronology. Well, virtually all, but the minimalists, and minimalists are those who essentially want to um, only uh, recognize or accept a minimal amount of historicity that's found in the Bible, only the bare minimum, that's what they want. So a lot of scholars are of this, of this persuasion. Well, virtually all but these kinds of people agree that counting these 479 plus years should begin in May of 90, 966 or 967, depending wow. on whether you accept Edwin Tiles, um or Roger Young's version of the Solomonic renal dates. Um, and... That means that essentially 1446 is the right year for the Exodus or 1445 is the right year, depending on which one of those two scholars you want to follow. And they're the ones who have done the best work, the best chronological work in my estimation. So those are the two options. 1446 is the right option. And I think there's very valid reason why we can be confident about 1446. So we then look at extra biblical records, uh, ancient sources apart from the Bible that can potentially weigh in on this uh, issue and help determine what's the right year of the Exodus. Well, one compelling argument for preferring 1446 BC as the year of the Exodus comes from extra biblical sources 
uh, and then in this case, the Jubilee cycles that agree with this date exactly yet are completely independent of the 479 plus years of 1 Kings 6.1. And of course, if you know ancient uh, Israelite history, you know that uh, after 49 years, the Jewish people were to celebrate. Uh, and actually, it, it was it was really marked in the 40, 49th year itself. So within the 49th year, it was as if it were a 50th year celebration, but it's in the 49th year. There is a, a, um, a celebration of, of these 50 years or so of God's goodness to them. Um, so the Talmud lists 17 cycles, right, of this 49-year um, movement in time. Every 49 years, there's a cycle. Next 49 years, there's another cycle, etc. The Talmud, and that, and that is um, one of the most important, considered to be sacred, ancient Jewish texts. Um, it lists or it documents Israel's entry into Canaan until the last recorded Jubilee in 574 BC, if you're using the Tishri calendar. Mm -hmm. And that date is 14 years after Jerusalem's destruction by the Babylonians. The Jubilee dates are precise only if the priests began counting years when they entered the land of Canaan in 1406 BC. So essentially what you do is you, you start with the last recorded Jubilee, and that's in 574 BC. And then you say, let's count backwards every 49 years, and let's go 17 cycles back. And when we do that, we end up in 1406 BC. And that happens to be precisely the year in which the, according to biblical chronology, uh, internal evidence from the biblical text itself, the Israelites enter Canaan, which is, of course, 40 years after the Exodus. So it fits perfectly. And if, that, if the Talmud is not enough of a strong source for this, a similar statement is found in chapter 11 of a, an ancient writing that's even older than the Talmud called the Seder Olam. Uh, and that's an early um, rabbinical writing that, again, predates the Talmud. And then there's more external evidence that supports 1446 BC as the year of the Exodus. And that comes from uh, two um, completely, two sources that are completely unrelated to the Hebrews or to the Jews themselves. One is the Tyrian king list, that's the king list of Tyre, and the other is what's called the Parian marble. And these affirm that 967 BC is the right year for the beginning of the construction on the first temple. And all of this is discussed in a 2012 article by Roger Young and Andrew Steinman. So based on these various independent witnesses, 1446 is preferable to 1445 for the exact year of the Exodus. And in my 2006 journal article on Amenhotep II as the Exodus Pharaoh, and I update this in my new book that's coming out, I explain why we can even be confident about the specific day mm -hmm. that the Exodus took place. And that is Friday, the 24th of April, 1446. Wow. So um, all of these sources um, work together with 1 Kings 6 1 to suggest that uh, 1446 is the right year for the Exodus. And then um, Judges 11 26 um, argues for a 15th century uh, Exodus conquest model. Uh, because in this passage, Jephthah, uh, if you know, of course, he's one of the judges, Jephthah stated in a letter to King Ammon, he said this, For 300 years Israel occupied Heshbon, Aror, and the surrounding settlements in all the towns along the Arnon River. So although it's impossible to calculate precise dates for yeah. Jephthah's judgeship, you know, when he judged, mm -hmm. various scholars have estimated that it began between 1130 and 1073 BC. And if you take the, the basically the middle of that around 1100, the implication is that the tribe of Reuben had been occupying the disputed area from, the, from Wadi Heshbon to the Arnon River since 1400 BC. So here's the idea. Jephthah says, well, this has been going on for 300 years that Israel has occupied this area. And if Jephthah's writing, of course, in 1100 BC, or he's speaking in 1100 BC, yeah. and he's looking back in time, you add 300 years, and that takes you back or, uh, to um, approximately 1400 BC. And of course, 1400 BC is the year in which the conquest would have ended 
according to biblical history. So that's another passage. And then a final passage for the early Exodus view in support of it is 1 Chronicles 6, 33 through 37. There, it lists 18 generations from Korah. Um, he is one of the contemporaries of Moses. And of course, if you know that name, it's kind of a... Um, um, you know, a name of ill repute because he instigated a rebellion against Moses. So, so if you measure from Korah to, uh, again, in Moses' day, forward in time to Haman, a temple musician in the time of David, um, that's 18 generations. Well, if you add one generation um, to extend um, the genealogy to Solomon, um, to Solomon himself, his time period, that results then in 19 generations from the Exodus to Solomon. And if you use Kenneth Kitchen, and of course he's a late Exodus advocate, by the way, if you use his estimated length of a generation of 25 years, that yields a total um, of about 475 years, a figure that compares very well with this 479 plus years we have in 1 Kings 6.1. So all three of these passages, pretty much represent extremely strong and powerful evidence that you can't overlook to support the early Exodus view. So what about um, the late, oh um, yeah, what about the late Exodus view? Let's look at the late Exodus view. So with this view, um, they of course, they have to deal with 1 Kings 6.1 and I have to admit, it's not a friend to them. This text is not friendly to their view. So for them to explain the 480 years of 1 Kings 6.1, uh, for example, Kenneth Kitchen, again, uh, a very prominent uh, Christian Egyptologist from the UK, um, appeals to the number 480 as what he calls non-oppressions, a, a non-aggression, non-oppressions aggregate theory. So for him, the 480th uh, year is turned into 480 years, of course, and now you're switching from a from an ordinal number to a cardinal number, which is really not fair because it should be 479 plus, less than 480. But he takes the 480 number and says this 480 years consists of nine periods of 40 years, which equals 360 years. Um, the third of which, so the third period of which is actually 80 years plus five aggregate periods of varying lengths. So essentially, he's mixing and matching, taking the 480 years and arbitrarily dividing it into subcategories that the Bible knows nothing about and saying, if we can take these um, periods of time as whole, whole numbers, then when totaled, the sum is a neat 480 years, which again is different than the 479 plus. Mm -hmm. A Jewish historian from Italy uh, named Umberto Casuto studied ascending and descending biblical Hebrew numbers. And from his study, he showed that a Hebrew number written in ascending order, that is, it goes up, yeah. as with this, 80, and, and here's how it is in Hebrew. It's written in 1 Kings 6.1, 80th and 400th. That's how it's written. So that's ascending. 80th is a smaller number. 400th is a greater number. So we're ascending in our count. Um, that's what we have in 1 Kings 6.1. So he looked at these kinds of um, numbering, ref these uh, numerical references, and he said, when we ascend like this, the smaller number, in this case 80th, is followed by the larger number, and it's always intended to be a technically precise figure. Mm -hmm. And moreover, he also showed that ordinal uses of numbers, such as 480th, do not function allegorically. Um, they, they, they can't be taken as representing periods. They're literal. And, and that whole allegorical approach is very subjective. So essentially, that's how uh, pretty much the preeminent scholar today among late Exodus advocates approaches 1 Kings 6.1. Um, and, um, with Judges 1126, for him, looking at these 300 years from the conquest, uh, of Canaan, uh, going forward to Jephthah, 
he says there's no uh, there's no convenient way to dispose of this enormous time period. So he resorts to an ad hominem argument, saying that it was hyperbole coming from an ignorant man. So essentially, and there's a there's a quote in his book is uh, I think 2003 book that he wrote on uh, biblical history, where he literally refers to Jephthah as being a man of ignorance. And so he made a mistake in his understanding of um, biblical chronology. And again, you have to ask the question, can we look at a biblical reference such as this and just chalk it up to a mistake? That's very problematic. Well, then um, that takes us to the most important uh, argument that late, ad ad uh, late Exodus uh, advocates um, hold to or, or appeal to, and that's from Genesis 47, 11 and from Exodus 1, 11. There are references here um, to the site that where Jacob settled with his family. So this is, again, the strongest argument of, of these proponents of the late Exodus view, saying that the Bible mentions the site of Jacob's settlement in Egypt as Ramses, of which um, this can only be connected to the site of Per Ramesse, and all of us probably would agree with that. And again, that is the site that's that's uh, adjacent to or catacorner to um, uh, Avaris that we talked about last time. Um, so it's it's on my screen now in the um, lower left quadrant here. This is um, Kantir, the modern name for biblical, uh, I'm sorry, for, for what, well, this term Ramesse, Per Ramesse, or yeah. also known as um, Ramses. Mm -hmm. So the site is here. And of course, Avaris is, is essentially here yeah. in this area, just uh, to the to the bottom left of it, to the southwest of it slightly, uh, less than a kilometer away. So um, um, we know that this site was not built or inhabited, that is Kantir, the site of the Ramesside kings, was not built or inhabited until the reign of Ramses II, and his reign is from 1290 to 1223, according to my uh, chronological scheme. Um, and he is the one who made the city his new and glorious capital. So according to this criticism by late, uh, late Exodus advocates, such as Kitchen and James Hoffmeyer and others, Moses is assumed to have written Ramesses in the text when he composed Genesis and Exodus. And in lieu of this, um, Kitchen dated the Exodus to... Um, 1260 BC. So let's look at how to uh, address this problem because this is a problem that needs to be addressed. How how could it be that Moses, if he's writing by 1406 BC, how could it be that Moses uh, writes a a the name of a city that doesn't show up in history until after 1290 BC? Right, that's a problem. So Avaris is the same thing as the site of biblical Ramses, according to the ancients. And that's the Nile Delta site to where Jacob uh, and his family moved. Um, and it says, so Joseph, uh, this is the text of Genesis 47, 11. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had ordered. So there it is right there, in the land of Ramesses. Okay, well, where is this located? Um, I don't really have this uh, indicated with any different coloration or a, or a box, but Avar, it says Avaris right here. So this is where it is in the Eastern Nile Delta. Well, um, what most late, advocate, uh, late Exodus advocates will never tell you if they themselves even know this, and they should know it, an inscription of a shrine door dating to the 20th dynasty um, that's now in the Pushkin Museum. So this is after the lifetime of uh uh, of Ramses II, yeah. um, mentions a certain kind of priest known as a Wab priest of Amun who was located at the harbor of Avaris. Well, um, where is this position? So all of Avaris, again, is this area to the southwest of Kantir. Mm -hmm. that's, that's more ancient Avaris than in the Ramesside period. And this area up here to the upper right, this is Kantir, this is Per Ramesse or P. Ramesse, uh, the house of Ramses that Ramses II built. It was used during his reign and all the subsequent uh, Ramesside kings of his of his uh, dynasty, and then pretty much all of the 
Ramesside kings of the subsequent um, 20th dynasty. So there's a priest of the 20th dynasty who's probably living in these in, in this area here uh, in the town of Peramsi. And he goes down to the harbor and he says, essentially, here I am at the harbor of Ramsey, uh, at the harbor of Avaris. So he's at this harbor. It's the harbor of um, of uh, Peramsi. It's not the harbor of Avaris that was used before the Ramesides arrived. That harbor is in the center of the picture, this massive area here. That is where the earlier harbor of Avaris was located. So why is it that a priest standing at the um, shores of the harbor of P Peramsi in uh, the 1100s BC is saying, I'm in the harbor of Avaris. The reason is because for the ancient Egyptians, this entire area, not just to the southwest of Kantir, but this entire area was considered Avaris. That being the case, the ancients, the Egyptians themselves, they called all of this area Avaris. Mm -hmm. That being true, we then have a, um, uh, a question. Hmm, why is it then in the Bible we have this, uh, this reference to Ramesse when it's a, a name of a city that didn't exist when Moses is writing by 1406 BC? Well, there's a wonderful article written by a scholar named Michael Grisanti uh, called The Place of Textual Updating. And in it, he looks at a number of places, not in the New Testament, but in the Hebrew Bible only, that... Over the period of the thousand years or so in which inspired writings were being added to the Old Testament or the Hebrew canon, the official um, uh, books that were considered um, scriptural or, or having come from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, mm -hmm. um, he notes that there are certain instances where there's an update made to something that takes place, like the reference to the site of Dan written by, you'd think, Moses. Um, it's in the Pentateuch, but Dan never received that name until later in time. So how do you account for this? Does Moses just guess ahead of time? Uh, another example is Deuteronomy uh, 34 at the death of Moses. Does Moses just write about his own death and the period of time after it all in guesswork? Probably not. Why? Because a later scribe probably comes along and kind of adds to the story a little bit to finish it up, to, to color it, to make it clear, to, you know, to put the bow on it, on the box, and finish that discussion. So um, Michael Grisanti looks at a number of these pretty much irrefutable examples of later scribal updating that comes to us in the form of the Bible. So that being the case, it's easy to theorize that Moses would have written a different city name mm -hmm. when he was writing um, this text in uh, in Genesis 47, 11, instead of writing Ramesse, he probably wrote, and not Avaris, he probably didn't write Avaris. He wrote the name of a, uh, um, that was changed during the middle of the 18th dynasty to Peru Nefer, which is Egyptian for pleasant journey. And of course, this site was the, um, the entry point or the exit point for all traffic coming into or from Asia, as well as into or from uh, Africa. So this was the hub through which all traffic flowed. And of course, that's where God strategically placed the Israelites. So Peru Nefer is what Moses probably wrote. And again, it was only a short period of time that it was in use. By the end of the 18th dynasty, the word Peru Nefer was gone. It was absent from the record. And that makes sense because remember, Avaris was um, abandoned, at, and this I go to into great detail in my book, to prove it was abandoned during the reign of Amenhotep II, the right candidate for the Exodus Pharaoh of Dynasty 18. And so um, once the, the town is no longer inhabited, and it's later re-inhabited, um, but not that very area where, where they were, the, the Egyptians were um, ruling from during Moses' day, um, that name went out of use. So later Israelites in, let's say, the period of the judges, let's say the early monarchy, if they looked at this uh, text and it says Peru Nefer or, or some equivalent of Peru Nefer, that would make no sense to most of their readers. So what they did is they updated that term Peru Nefer to the term that was in vogue in their day, 
which is Ramesy. So they didn't necessarily uh, viciously tamper with the text. They simply modified the reading of the text to not change the meaning, but change the under understandability of that site. So for that reason, the later Jewish uh, scribes almost undoubtedly updated the name from Perunefer to Ramesi. And so that defeats the strongest argument of the late Exodus proponents who pretty much put all their eggs in one basket and say, wow. um, we, we support this view because of the reference to uh, Ramesi, which was never inhabited before 1290 BC. So these are the two main uh, views. And again, I, I, I've given you much more support mm -hmm. for the uh, early Exodus view, which I subscribe to, and, and not um, a, a full representation of, of either of you, really, but just to show you the strongest points for what I consider the right view and the, and the, weak, and, and the strongest uh, argument against uh, the wrong view, which is the late Exodus view. That's, no, that's really great, Dr. Petrovich. I mean, it's it's good to see the biblical data is also confirmed by, you know, extra biblical data, the Talmud um, and so on and so forth. But you mentioned there about the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, I know there's debate regarding which view of um, early or late date, who is the Exodus of the Pharaoh. If anyone's ever seen, um, I think it's Cecil B. DeMille's The Famous Ten Commandments, he identifies the Pharaoh of the Exodus as Ramesses. But you just said someone different, Amahotep II. Um, can you tell us about him? Was he a, a native Egyptian? Some people think that Pharaoh at the time of the Exodus was a uh, Hyksos, Semitic person. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you discuss these things? Sure. And what I want to do, Simon, before I get to that, I want to take you back a little bit further in time. Yep. to the um, Pharaoh who enslaved the Hebrews. Yes, sorry. Yeah, and there's a question about whether he is a native Egyptian or whether he is a foreign Hyksos. So that's a great question. And for that, um, I wanna pop back into a slideshow that will allow you to follow along a little bit. Um, so the, the text really that we have to appeal to, to understand what's at, what's at work here, what's at play uh, is in Exodus 1 especially verses 8 through 10, and here's what it says. And I've highlighted in yellow uh, okay. the most important parts for our purpose. It says this, Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know of Joseph. So he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and in the event of war, they would join themselves to the ones hating us and fight against us and depart from the land. So there's a lot going on here. And you can see that there are a lot of concerns that the, this new king has, this new king who arose over Egypt, who did not know of Joseph. So we want to ask this question, what Hyksos king would not know of Joseph. Uh, the Hyksos uh, are foreigners, Asiatics, who migrated in large number into northern Egypt, into the, uh, the eastern Nile Delta, and they sat down, essentially they established uh, um, a beachhead there, if you will, um, and they built up um, actually the very site where Jacob had settled, which nobody disputes this. Th they had a kingdom, uh, it's known uh, to history as the 15th dynasty of Egypt. They had this kingdom. They had a king who ruled on the throne, and they essentially took over Lower Egypt. In fact, they moved all the way into um, uh, Middle Egypt and pushed up against Upper Egypt as well, attempting to, uh, to overtake Upper Egypt, but they never really were able to pull that off completely. So... These Hyksos kings, where did they settle? They settled at Avaris. Hmm, interesting. The very site where Jacob lived, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of his descendants as well. Mm -hmm. So what Hyksos king ruling from the very city that was the hub of the entire uh, Hebrew population, what king of the Hyksos would not know of Joseph? I mean, there's examples of this all around. There's the living... 
uh, witness of all of the descendants of Jacob and Joseph who are there um, at Avaris. Um, so where did the Israelites live? They lived in Avaris, right where the Hyksos settled, and they predated the Hyksos there. Um, so um, Eugene Carpenter referred to, this, to the new kings coming to power as indicating that the founding of a new dynasty is intended. So not just did a new king arise and take the throne, but an entirely new dynasty. And this makes perfect sense. It's almost inconceivable that you could have a king continuing to rule from the same dynasty who would understand this, or who wouldn't understand um, who, who Joseph was. Um, so th the two best examples of this could be the 18th dynasty and the 19th dynasty. And of course, the 18th dynasty starts with Amosa. The 19th dynasty starts with Ramses I two rule, rulers before Ramses II. Well, uh, Carpenter qualified his statement by noting that the first kings of these two dynasties generally have not been targeted as the probable king of Exodus 1.8. And of course, for me, that's a little bit mysterious. Why wouldn't they consider this? Um, Carpenter is correct in his hunch that the founder of one of these dynasties is the proper candidate for this king, even if Carpenter did not know that Amosa of Dynasty 18 is the correct choice. Yet he conceded in a footnote that Albright, um, a um, biblical scholar and archaeologist who essentially popularized the late Exodus view, he considered it highly probable that Amosa was the king who did not know of Joseph. Amosa of Dynasty 17 and 8. So Amosa was the last king of Dynasty 7 and the first king of dynasty 18. Um, he's the optimal candidate for this king who did not know of Joseph because he conquered Avaris after having come all the way from a Theban dynasty in Upper Egypt. So if you go far to the south, way upstream up the Nile River, that's where he and his 17th dynasty were established. And they were disconnected completely from the Hyksos. In fact, they were enemies. They were mortal enemies. And so he was located um, in Upper Egypt um, until he moved downstream with his forces, attacked the Hyksos holdings, and overtook Avaris. So in contrast to his background, the earlier northern kings of Lower Egypt, Egyptian and Hyksos alike, undoubtedly would have known of Joseph from Dynasties 12 and 13 until the expulsion of the Hyksos at the end of Dynasty 15, since they were acquainted intimately with Avaris and its inhabitants. The biblical text states that Pharaoh was afraid that the Israelites might join themselves to certain people. Which people? To the ones hating us, that is, hating the native Egyptians. And in this case, I'm suggesting it's the, it's the native Egyptian dynasts of Dynasty 17 who've now um, conquered Avaris De defeated their Hyksos enemies and they drove them out um, amidst a proclamation of war and that in battle against the Egyptians, the coalition may win, right? The Israelites and the Hyksos together against the native Egyptians might just win that battle. And the result would be an Israelite departure from Egypt. And that is not what the Pharaoh wanted. According to a scholar named Prop, this king's headstrong action exemplified the folly of a young person who attains power. While there is not much archaeological evidence to verify that the Israelites were located at Avaris when the transition from Hyksos control to Egyptian control occurred, the historical and archaeological record can be compared to the biblical text in order to determine if compatibility exists between the two witnesses. Well, according to the historical account of Amosa, the son of Ibana, that's a different uh, Amosa than King Amosa, mm -hmm. the Hyksos fled from Avar. So they were defeated by the native Egyptians of Dynasty 17. And the survivors, the few who survived, fled from Avaris, fled from northern Egypt to the Levant, to the area that we know of as Canaan and later Israel, to a place called Sharuhin. It's in southeastern Canaan, where they lingered for three years, according to the ancients. 
The native Egyptian conquest of Avaris was followed by their occupation of the city, including the construction of a defensive wall, which demonstrates that the Egyptians saw the Hyksos as a continued threat. They built the wall expressly to protect themselves against a possible Hyksos invasion. This evidence fits perfectly with a scenario in which Amose feared that the Israelites would join forces with the expelled Hyksos who had relocated to this city called Sharuhan, because together the two of them potentially could reclaim Avaris and dispose of the victorious Egyptians, right? Because you have the, the warring, um, conniving Hyksos people with the massive number of the Israelite people who the king already said outnumber the native Egyptians. So you put those two elements together, that can spell trouble, especially if you put weapons in the hands of the Israelites. Since the Hyksos had left, Amosa also feared that after these joint forces win the battle, the Israelites would leave Egypt, creating an even greater vacuum in the Nile Delta. So essentially, it's like taking the engine out of a car. How can you expect that someone's car could work without the engine? Therefore, Pharaoh who enslaved, uh, the Pharaoh who enslaved the Israelites had to be a native Egyptian from another part of Egypt, not a Hyksos king, meaning that the last king of Dynasty 17, who became the first king of Dynasty 18, Amose, is the ideal candidate. So that answers why this first king of this dynasty, or the one who did not know of Joseph, mm -hmm. almost certainly had to be a native Egyptian and not a foreign Hyksos person. That's really helpful, um, Dr. Petrovich. Um, you've mentioned the, the, the date of the Exodus as your date is 1446. I think that's the correct date. But a lot of um, people who, who advocate the other date, um, the late date would say, well, there's just no evidence in, in, for, from the archeology span of, of, of the Exodus in the 1446 BC. Have you found any evidence that corroborates the biblical date? And Simon, are you talking about evidence in Canaan now? Yeah, from from actually from 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 the site in Egypt. Yeah, from for for, for the Exodus from from Egypt. Oh, okay. So so evidence from Egypt itself. Yes, and all of this is going to be in my um, uh, in my second book that's coming out soon. And if I'm ever invited to a conference, I will show a whole slideshow on this. So. I'll skip the slideshow um, on this one. But um, first of all, um, we have to admit, we have to acknowledge that the event of an exodus like this, a departure, is very difficult for an archaeologist to pinpoint. Um, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, I moved locally from about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes away uh, in a city called, uh, from a city called Katy to um, to Richmond, where I am now. Um, I cleaned up everything that I had there, right? It had, you know, it's a house I was renting and it had to be clean for the, the next tenants who were going to come in. So if you were to go and to look for evidence that I lived there, you would have a hard time finding much. And if you were to say, well, how did you move? What was your route in moving from the house in Katy to the house you're at in Richmond? Well, did I take the West Park Tollway? Did I take, um, FM 1093, did I take Mason Road and take other um, roads to get there? What method did I use to move from one house to the other? Probably you can't go back and find any record of it. And even if, let's say, I would, I would have moved like the Israelites did, I put everything on a cart and I, and I led the cart away from Katy to Richmond, probably you'd not be able to see um, any evidence of my movement. So the actual movement of people is extremely difficult for an archaeologist to pinpoint. So that's really important. Um, then, having said that, as a, as a disclaimer, we do have what I'm convinced is an extremely important um, finding at the site of Avaris. If you go to the part of Avaris that's known as Esbet Rushdie, um, that was the place that became the, the Hyksos headquarters while they were uh, ruling from there in Dynasty 15. And then when the native Egyptians came and they chased out the, um, the Hyksos, they essentially destroyed their um, 
palatial district. In, in other words, all of the buildings that the Hyksos used, they destroyed them, they wiped them out, and they built their own buildings there, and that became their headquarters. Um, and so there was a, um, a royal city that was built there. And in that royal city, uh, dating to the reign of Amenhotep II, this, this king who I'm connecting to uh, uh, the Exodus Pharaoh, and I'm not the only one who does by any stretch, at that very site, um, in the palatial district, and this is not looking at the, at the um, residential district where the people would have lived, but where the king was residing, there was a large number, and I don't know what the exact number is, it's in the 30s or more, of burials that were found yeah. by the Austrian archaeological team that dug there under Monfred Betok. Um, they found a number of burials, and those burials represented four, the burial of four different types of animals. Uh, on occasion, there were individual animals buried. Most of the time, there were numbers, plural numbers of animals buried um, together in graves, very carefully buried and yet very quickly buried. Um, and there were four kinds of animals. We find those four animals in Exodus 11 and 12. Uh, when we get to the... Um, the death angel and the uh, the night of the Passover. The four animals named there are dogs, cattle, sheep, and goats, right? Those four animals are named. Those are the four animals that show up in these graves. And the very little pottery that's that was found in these graves dates to, it's, it's diagnostic for the reigns of two kings. In other words, it's one set of pottery that's diagnostic for, for two mm -hmm. reigns the reigns of Thutmose III and his son, Amenhotep II. What that tells you is those burials took place at the latest during the reign of Amenhotep II. And since there's plenty of evidence on site that Amenhotep II occupied um, Avaris, and there's, there's, there's record of this in the uh, written uh, inscriptional uh, record as well, um, we know that Amenhotep II was ruling when... when um, this was occupied and used as a launching point for all of the attacks that the, these pharaohs were making into Asia to conquer territory for Egypt. And essentially they were imperialists, ancient imperialists. So um, that ceramic evidence, the evidence from that pottery points to Amenhotep II's reign as the right time for these burials. And you know what's fascinating? The majority of the animals that were buried there were sheep and goats. And of course, sheep and goats were the two options for the Israelites to be able to uh, uh, slaughter their, their, their clean animal, their unblemished animal, and use the blood of it uh, to spread on the lentil of their door so that they could uh, avoid the, the devastating, deathly judgment of the death angel who would come and destroy the oldest uh, the firstborn of every house, so they could avoid this. Um, and Simon, here's what's fascinating. Not only are the majority of the animals sheep and goats, but the majority of the animals were found to have died while in their first year of age, which is exactly what the Hebrew text says as a requirement. There's a term there, a technical term called son of a year. That's the 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 age of those that those animals, the sheep or the goat, had to be. It had to be a son of a year. What is that? Less than one year of time. And it matches perfectly. So this is extremely strong corroborative evidence to match the 10th plague on Egypt, which I think is as close as we can come to archaeological evidence to identify uh, the event of the Exodus itself. Wow, that, that's amazing when you take the time to do all this, Dr. Petrovich. We appreciate the work um, that you put in. You, you, you've given us the date of the Exodus, 1446. You've told us that he was a native Egyptian. You've even given us his name, Amenhotep II. And I know you've written um, a, a really detailed article on that. That's really helpful. We've put um, the website for that in the links. But a question, and we'll move on to this, Dr. Petrovich, that's okay. A question that often lots of Christians ask when they read um, the text of, of Exodus is, is where did the Israelites cross the, the Red Sea? And I know there's 
a number of different locations, the Bitter Lakes, the Gulf of Suez, um, the Gulf of Aqaba. How, how do we work all this out? What, what's the location you would suggest the Bible gives us? Sure. And um, essentially, Simon, I, I, I need to preface um, my answer with, with this very important statement. And that is just as, as it is difficult to, uh, to find out, to find evidence of the movement of these people out of Egypt mm -hmm. and you know, or out of Avaris and across Egypt and, and into the desert, we can hardly pin them down um, archaeologically. We can also uh, say that it's extremely difficult with any confidence to pinpoint a place where this crossing took place. So mm -hmm. that is the, the really important statement. So, so that's the mountain that I'm going to give you. And now I want to look at the molehill um, and look at possibilities for identifying this location. So I'm going to jump into a slideshow here. Um, and show you, first of all, this slide. So the Israelites are where? Uh, they're located here in Avaris. Uh, hopefully you can see my cursor moving to the lower left. Yes. Um, they're located here and they need to move essentially eastward. However they do that, it could be east and north. It could be due east. It could be east and south. We really don't know. Well, they departed from this site, Avaris slash Peronefer slash Ramesses. Um, and they quite plausibly would have ventured um, and this is my, my um, personal yep. thoughts on this at the moment. And I may change my view in a year or five years. Who knows? Um, possibly they moved a little bit to the, to the northeast or east from uh, Avaris um, along this road of Horus momentarily. And, and the road of Horus um, is the main uh, highway, essentially, that takes us all the way into the land of Canaan. And Canaan, we know it later as the, uh, the Great Trunk Road. It's known in New Testament times as the Via Maris which is the way, uh, translate that from, from Latin is the way of the sea. It's that same road and it connects to it. The, the way of Horus connects to that road. So they probably or possibly moved a little bit east, northeast. And then at some point here, they would have veered off of it, may, maybe. And again, this is all conjectural mm -hmm. and, and traveled to the east, um, getting further out of Egypt. And again, their goal is to go further to the east so that they can worship God right? That's their goal. So they have to go east, uh, however they do it. So they move to the east. Um, now, a really important verse in all this is Exodus 13, 17. Um, oh, and I'll have to mention, um, so they ventured off this, um, off of the long road um, before they came to the first Egyptian fortress of Sile, which is located here. Um, that's the first of a number of Egyptian forts along the road that we know of as the Way of Horse as you go toward um, Canaan. And so this set of fortresses begins with Sile and it ends at Gaza. And of course, we know of Gaza today from all the eruptions of the, um, the, the terror, terrorists who are blasting missiles into Israel. So along that way, it's littered with, um, during the New Kingdom, the period of Moses' lifetime and after, it's littered with these fortresses. Well, here's what it says in Exodus 13, 17. So it happened that when Pharaoh sent away the people, that God did not lead them on the road of the land of the Philistines, mm -hmm. even though it was near, because God said, lest the people would change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Now, technically, this whole area, this, this uh, where this road is, that's an Egyptian road. That is not um, the road of the land of the Philistines. It's the road that goes to the land of the Philistines, but it's not the, the road of the land of the Philistines. So, um, so I don't know how technical we want to be on that one, but essentially the whole point is God didn't send them all the way along this road up into Canaan. That's the whole point. Why? Because he didn't want the people to look around and say, uh-oh, we see soldiers everywhere. Mm -hmm. We're in a war zone. Let's go back to Egypt. Where would they have first seen these, uh, this, this war zone? Right here at Sile. So probably before Sile, they would have been off of this road of Horus if they even stepped on it at all. And then the biblical text is not saying, you know, it would have been wrong for them to take one step on this terrible road or something to the, 
to that effect. We can't read into the text, something like that. The whole point is they didn't take that whole entire road to make their way into Canaan. Instead, they um, got off the road or, or moved in a different um, along a different path. And so very conceivably, if they moved mainly due eastward, which is very plausible, not, not automatic, but plausible, they would have hit this area right here known as the Bala Lakes. Um, by the time that the Egyptian army had assembled and pursued them, the Israelites probably were in the vicinity of these Bala Lakes. In Exodus 14, 12, uh, uh, 2, God told the sons of Israel to turn back and camp in front of the place where the sedges grow. And of course, a sedge is a kind of plant. And it's most native to areas that have a lot of water. So they sedge, sedge plants really favor um, uh, moist or even wet climates, such as you have with swamps. So they were to camp in front of the place where the sedges grow. In Hebrew, this is pi hahirot, in plural, the sedges. Um, between the fort and the sea, the text says. So they were to, to camp between the fort and the sea. Not Probably not the Mediterranean Sea, but some other sea. Hmm, what sea is that? You will camp in front of Baal Tzaphon, opposite from it by the sea. Well, the fort that he's talking about, and again, this is my view and not everybody holds it, but I would suggest that the fort is probably the one at Sile. So it's not the name of a city here in Hebrew when with the word for, um, for fort, but yeah. it's simply the fort. So it's probably the fort at Sile, uh, right in this position. While Baal Tzaphon, which literally means Baal, that's that god, the pagan god that we talked about in our last webinar, who was the king of the gods in the Levant. So there's a god, an, an offshoot of Baal known as Baal of the north, and he was a Canaanite deity. Um, and that reference is probably to a site with a shrine devoted to this deity. So it's not necessarily a massively populated site, but a place with a shrine devoted to that deity. And I think uh, James Hoffmeyer proves that uh, sufficiently. So it's possible that a, a place like um, Tel Defeneh here could be Baal Tzaphon, a place where there was a shrine devoted to this deity. And certainly it had to be in close proximity to some fort. And sure enough, this site is in very close proximity to the site of Sile. So that's a very plausible scenario so far. Well, let's add to it. A cylinder seal from the late Middle Kingdom, and that's the 18th century BC in this case, depicting Baal Tzaphon as protector of sailors, right? That's how he was termed. He was viewed as protector of sailors. This was discovered at Avaris. And yes, that's the Avaris where the Israelites were. So the site uh, um, where we're talking about here, Baal Tzaphon, almost certainly is connected to maritime activity. That is, sea, you know, sea travel. And it's got to be close to Avaris. And again, here's this deity in the middle of this uh, uh, seal. Uh, actually, it's a sealing, I-N-G. But in, in the middle of the depiction is this, um, is this god, Baal Tzaphon. And you can see that he's standing on two hills, right? One foot on one and one foot on another. Um, so probably its location is connected to a nearby hill or two hills along the coast. One possibly being... Tel Defenet, and a tell is a mound. It's a hill. So it makes perfect sense if a site such as Tel Defenet is where um, this deity is standing, designating um, the, the site. If this is the case, the Israelites probably camped near the Mediterranean coast where they turned um, and were um, backed up against a body of water, quite possibly the Bala Lakes. So I'd suggest to you two legitimate possibilities. Again, not the only possibilities, but two legitimate possibilities are that one, the Israelite 
encampment, right, where God told them to wait would be mm-hmm. here on the on the western central part of the Bala Lakes. Another possibility is here in this area, which is across from Tel Defene and directly south of Sile. So that's another possibility for where they would have camped. Now, um, who charges after um, the Israelites? It's the the army of Pharaoh. What are they traveling on or with or in? Well, they're traveling in or on chariots. Where do chariots go and where do chariots not go? If anybody studied uh, ancient history of the Levant where the Israelites ended up, they know that the Philistines, of course, were the masters of chariots later in the second millennium BC. But they were not able to use their chariots to go uphill into um, what's called the central mountain spine in Israel to the east and attack the Israelites up there in the mountain country, in the hill country, because chariots do not work on unlevel ground. They only work on level ground. So wherever these chariots were going to pursue the Israelites, folks, this is really, really important. It's very simplistic but extremely important. It had to be a place where chariots could move freely. The further you get away from the roads, the more difficult it is to expect you would have terrain that could be traversed by Egyptian chariots. It just would not work. So the beauty of these two options that I presented is chariots could chase them all the way to where these locations were and conceivably uh, meet the Israelites there and attack them from their chariots. So um, that is what I think is the most plausible scenario for what happens with the site where the crossing takes place. So obviously you can see these red arrows. So the Israelites would have crossed um, on dry land, either here or here, according to these two possible scenarios. And then um, the the Egyptians would have chased them, you know, come off of the uh, road of Horus, come down to where they were, and then when they were able to chase them into the uh, the seabed, and of course the wa- walls of the water came down upon them and killed them. And then the Israelites, after you know, having survived, they then tr- uh, having made it across the Bala Lakes. Um, they would have traveled southward in their long journey. Now, again, this isn't the only view. There are others. Some scholars, such as um, Barry Beitzel, a, f- a fantastic uh, scholar, um, he and James Hoffmeyer as well, two late ev- Exodus advocates who have been connected to uh, Trinity um, uh, Trinity Seminary, which is in or, or uh, Divinity School, which is in uh, Deerfield, Illinois, in the United States. Uh, they suggest that instead the Israelites traveled south southeast, and they came to uh, this this lake called Lake Timna. And this lake, instead of Lake uh, Lake Bala or the Bala Lakes, would have been where they crossed, and then the southward movement would have taken place here. Which Simon takes us to the second half of our question: Where is it that Mount Sinai is located? So most of us would suggest that the Israelites are at least at some point, they arrive at this point, which is um, at the northeastern corner of the uh, Gulf of Suez. And from here, they move further toward their goal, which is the mount, um, the mountain known as Sinai. So that being the case, uh, the traditional view is that the Israelites would then have gone down to the south-southeast all the way here, and we talked about this last time, Serebit Yochadim, where the turquoise mines were, where the Israelites from um, uh, from Avaris would have made their way down uh, in in expeditions to extract turquoise. So the Israel, these later Israelites of 1446 BC would have uh, gone further south than Serebit Yochadim and made their way into this area where one of a number of options exists for um, a mountain that could be identified with Sinai. So that's the traditional view. But 
um, there are problems with the traditional view. Um, Hoffmeyer, in his book, Ancient Israel in Sinai, seem, says that Southern Sinai seems the most likely region in which Mount Sinai of the Torah is located. So he's advocating this traditional view in his book on page 148. Um, what do we know about Sinai? So let's kind of, before we look any further, let's kind of expand our understanding of what Mount Sinai is all about. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, the way to do that is to look at other names for what it's called. Well, here are three, at least three additional names for Mount Sinai. One, in Exodus 3, 1 and other places, it's called Horeb. So it's, it's Mount Sinai, it's Mount Horeb. Two, it's called the Mountain of God in a number of um, texts. And then three, it's called Mount Paran in Deuteronomy 33 and Habakkuk 3. That's really important because this presents a huge problem for the Southern Sinai view for the identification of the location of Mount Sinai. So from Deuteronomy 33, he who is came from Sinai and rose over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. This is what we call parallel um, uh, poetical, uh, parallel poetical structure, right? Um, it's, it's a, it, it's taking two different phrases or statements, two different thoughts and tying them together. It's called synonymous parallelism. So seer and Sinai, um, are similar to Mount Paran. They're being connected, etc. Um, with the rest of that verse. Then Habakkuk 3, God came from T Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Where did he come from? Where did he meet them? At Mount Paran. Um, we also know that Mount Sinai is within grazing distance of Midian, meaning for uh, feeding your flocks. Because according to Exodus 3.1, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So we now that we know these things, let's quickly evaluate this Southern Sinai view for the location of Mount Sinai. What are the problems? First, the location is a Christian tradition originating in the fourth century AD, not BC, AD, with at least a gap of about 1200 years from the last mention of Mount Sinai in a written biblical source, 1 Kings 19, to the time in which the tradition begins for this being the location, the, the apparent location of Mount Sinai. So how much stock do you want to put into 1,200 years later, somebody comes along and says, this is Mount Sinai? That's a problem, mm -hmm. a weakness. Two, it's in the opposite direction from the promised land right? The promised land is up to the north. Now we're going further down to the south. Three, it's too far from Midian for Moses to have been pasturing Jethro's flocks there. How can Moses, who's living in Midian with the big, big problem of the Gulf of Aqaba between him and his flocks and um, Mount Sinai, how could he take his flocks all the way up to the uh, northernmost point of the Gulf of Aqaba and go all the way down southwest or uh, west, uh, south southwest to a place here to, um, uh, to provide for his flocks. It doesn't make a lot of sense um, geographically. Um, four, this site in southern Sinai is not located in the wilderness of Paran. And we just saw Paran mm -hmm. equals Mount Sinai. That's not where Paran is. If you look at this uh, elongated rectangle, it's um, it's enclosing two words, Midbar Paran. And that essentially is the desert of, um, of Paran. So where is the desert of Paran? It's to the northwest of this, uh, of this northernmost point of the Gulf of Aqaba. So all of this area is the, um, the area of Paran. Yep. Paran is not located down here to the south. Five, it's too far from Kadesh Barnea for the Israelites with their livestock 
to have made the journey in 11 days. Um, so it's possible that the Israelites traveled uh, south, um, southeast, um, past the Great Bitter Lake, past the uh, Little Bitter Lake, and then um, moved on this Trans-Sinai Highway, which was a normal main highway or thoroughfare that takes you to Midian. It's the main road to Midian that goes through the desert of Paran all the way um, to where um, Midian is. And of course, in Exodus 18, we already see that the Israelites have traveled um, to Midian because he's meeting there with his father-in-law. Yes. So only this makes sense. The southern, um, uh, southern Sinai view doesn't make a lot of sense. So this is a map looking at all of the travel routes that go through Sinai. So the one that we're suggesting, that I'm suggesting to you, um, is this eastward movement, this eastward road that goes um, through essentially through the heart of Sinai. And it's the main road to Midian. And of course, Exodus 2.15 says, Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. So when Moses traveled to Midian, how did he go? How did he venture from Avaris? which is way up in this area, how did he go from here to Midian? Probably that same route that we looked at. And he comes down here to this northernmost point of the Gulf of Suez, and he takes a, uh, a left turn uh, and, and uses this Trans-Sinai Highway to go straight to the land of Midian. And that's where he, of course, meets his bride and spends 40 years of time, we know from the book of Acts. All right. Um, so Horeb in Deuteronomy 1-2, the journey from the Israelite nation to travel from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by, the, uh, by Mount Seir took 11 days on foot. That works well if you're locating um, Sinai in central Sinai, but doesn't work well at all if you lo locate it in southern Sinai. And of course, Mount Seir, um, the place, the site of the Edomites is located in uh, Paran as well. So Bryant Wood, among others, has um, suggested that this certain mountain here called Gebel Hasham et Tarif is the location, the probable location of the Israelites rather than somewhere uh, far to the uh, south, southwest of here. And again, this is very close to that main highway, uh, that Trans-Sinai Highway that takes you to the land of Midian. Um, this is a photograph that he took, that Bryant Wood took of this Gebel Hasham et Tarif, this very strong candidate for the site of the Israelites. And he has other forms of evidence that he suggests um, coincide and may even um, be actual remnants of the presence of the Israelites there. And I won't go into all of that, but all of that re remains in the realm of possibility. Then they, that other issue is this Deuteronomy 1-2, where it says it takes 11 days to travel from Horeb to Kadesh. So if you go from here, from Gebel Hasham et Tarif, if you travel by foot um, or by you know donkey, whatever, and you, um, you go all the way to Kadesh Barnea, which is located here, that fits perfectly for a time frame of about 11 days. It doesn't fit well at all if your Sinai is down here near um, the later St. Catherine's Monastery, somewhere in Southern Sinai, that's not an 11 days journey. So for all of these reasons, I think that um, Bryant Wood is right in locating Sinai where he has. Thanks, Dr. Petrovich, it's uh, really helpful. Now, I just wanna ask a follow-up question because I know a lot of people sure. uh, are talking about this in the chat. Um, because they've been influenced either by people like Ron Wyatt or they've seen um, patterns of evidence which places, which seems to place um, the crossing of um, the Red Sea at the Gulf of Aqaba and then they go um, further into the land of uh, Midian. And I can't remember the name of, of the mount, mountain which they think is Sinai. Um, maybe you can remember. What, what do you say to, to, to those um, conclusions that people have come to? And essentially, um, that is looking at what should be considered a very radical view, which is that the Israelites traveled all the way into modern Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, I've even been contacted by a tour group that um, attempts to connect ancient inscriptions to Hebrew inscriptions, which, of course, 
that's the same Hebrew of the late Bronze Age and Middle Bronze Age even too as well. That's in my book that I, I'm suggesting we can, you know, it's easily decipherable as Hebrew, but those inscriptions that are in Saudi Arabia um, are definitely not the same script that we know of as Hebrew and that evolves into the later form that shows up in inscriptions that are throughout Canaan during the biblical period. So um, there's really no compelling evidence to suggest to us for any good reason that the Israelites ventured all the way into Saudi Arabia. There's no evidence for that. Um, there are lots of sensational connections, um, certain objects that supposedly are, um, you know, uh, identifiable as where the Israelites would have stopped and where the crossing would have taken place and maybe chariot wheels in a body of water and so forth. But none of these has any credibility. None of this has any, any certain connectability to, to what we know from good science in the archaeological record that connects um, artifacts from modern day to objects from the ancient world that are um, datable and that we would expect to be at certain places. That's really helpful. You've given us some good data um, to follow. That makes logical sense of, of what the biblical text um, actually tells us. But I want to um, now maybe end with a final question, but before we take maybe one or two from um, the audience tonight, is that there's, I, I hear there's a new inscription um, from ancient Lachish that dates to the 15th century BC. What what can you tell us about its importance and how it links to what we're talking about? Sure, and that's um, an inscription that uh, came to uh, the forefront with a publication, I think it was April 15th of this year, 2021. And um, the inscription doesn't really have a name. Uh, I've given it, I, I've assigned my own name to it since the excavators didn't assign a name to it, which is the Lahish. Um, Milk Bowl Ostrakhan. So um, I'm going to pop this up onto the screen, this Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrakhan that dates to um, uh, the, actually, uh, my, what I've written there is not correct. It's, it's the end of Late Bronze 1B and, okay. or the beginning of Late Bronze 2, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, of Late Bronze uh, 2A. So it's one or the other. And this is a picture of the, um, the inscription. And this is most definitely what I call um, PCH, Proto-Consonental Hebrew Script. Uh, so it's from the site of Lachish. That's one of the main Canaanite cities of Canaan. It's fa in fact, it's the second largest city, Canaanite city, during the Canaanite period in all of Canaan, second only to Chatzor up, that's up in the north or northeast in the... Um, uh, Hula Valley. And this inscription, um, you can see that a lot of the ink has been preserved uh, here, here, and here. And the um, and I, I made my own uh, drawing of it. So I, I took this picture, I loaded it onto um, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, which I often do when I want to make an accurate um, electronic drawing. And I drew right over that using uh, electronic, um, uh, the, the electronic cursor, and then used edit points to uh, to fine tune all of that. And so now we can have a a, a very clear picture of um, of um, what's on the inscription. Then we pull away. I'm sorry. Um, then we can pull away the picture, and we're left with the text. And so this is offer, I'm offering you essentially a spoiler of what's going to be in the article I'm going to publish this fall, Lord willing, in Bible and Spade. The excavators correctly identified this first word, which reads uh, right to left. This is the word for servant, eved, uh, the word for servant. Mm -hmm. And they identified this word, which reads right to left, which is the word for honey. What they didn't do is that they didn't... Um, attempt to translate this word here, which is a very discernible, very simple word. And in orange, I've filled in the missing parts to the to the letters here. This is clearly an ayin. Ayin is the word for I, E-Y-E. -E. So this is um, a pictographic I, again, the, the object on your face, that kind of I. This is the shepherd's crook 
from the ver Hebrew verb lamad, which means to learn or to teach. And a lamad is a teaching tool. It's a shepherd's crook. That's what a shepherd uses to teach, whether it's a sheep or it's a child, he uses that tool. So if you put that together, it's, it makes the word al. Al is on, upon, or over. So now you can add this word to the first word and the third word and come up with a very discernible translation, which is servant in charge of honey. So that's almost certainly the, um, the translation of this uh, inscription. The only thing that's left um, as a question mark, at least for me, and definitely for the for the uh, publishers, the translate the the archaeologist and epigrapher who published this, is this letter here. This is the N letter, the N letter, because it's a snake, and a snake in Hebrew is Nun, which starts with the N sound. So it's difficult to know exactly why there's this um, seemingly arbitrary drawing of a of a snake with a N letter in the middle of the inscription. So um, at some point, maybe I'll understand that or figure that out, but um, as of now, it remains anomalous uh, and it does for any other scholar that I know of as well. So um, this inscription, and here's the really exciting part. This inscription um, is datable to the end of late bronze one because there's late bronze one material built right over top of it. So, um, it's almost certainly an inscription that's um, that's inscribed by a Hebrew who was part of or immediately thereafter the the overtaking of um, Lachish by the Israelites because it says in Joshua 10 that the Israelites conquered Lachish. That being the case, they would have been around there physically and able to drop um, an, uh, an ostrichen. This is known as an ostrichen. It's a piece of um, a fired clay that has a, a writing on it. So it's called an ostrichen. They dropped this ostrichen or wrote this ostrichen um, at the site of Lachish. And it ended up there in the archaeological record. It makes no sense whatsoever with the late Exodus view to have an inscription at the end of late bronze 1b, which ends in approximately 1400 BC. It makes no sense at all for a Hebrew inscription to be there and tied to the destruction of Lachish by some um, unidentified, otherwise unidentified group of people. So these are probably the Hebrews, and they left this, this Hebrew inscription behind, and it probably refers to a person who's in charge of honey. And of course, what, it, what was the biblical description of, the, the, of uh, the promised land? It would be a land flowing with milk and honey. Oddly enough, isn't it? Yeah. This is a servant in charge of honey and that the bowl is considered to be a milk bowl, according to what we know from a ceramic study. So here we have it, the land of milk and honey at the very time that Joshua and his and his um, uh, followers, the Israelites, uh, were with him. So this is a very exciting inscription. That's amazing. And it actually confirms the dates that you have suggested to us tonight. And this is a recent find, you said. Yes. Yeah. A recent find, um, it was found um, a year or two ago. I forget exactly what now what the date was, but um, only published this year. Great. That's excellent. Well, this has been a, a really uh, fascinating discussion, Dr. Petrovich, and we thank you for your time. We've got, I think we've got a few minutes left where we might be able to take one or two questions sure. that come up in the comments section. Um, and I know you've written on some of these before, but people might want to know the answers. Someone's asked, the nomadic Hebrew has asked um, regarding, um, yeah, which is the correct date, correct about Exodus 12, 40 to 41, the Leningrad Codex, the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Samaritan Pentateuch says there were, uh, Israel were in Egypt and Canaan 430 years. Thank you so much. So obviously this is a famous um, textual variant for those who don't know. Um, there's the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch. Pentateuch. Can, can you explain this for us, Dr. Petrovich? Yeah, essentially there is a disagreement among the ancient sources. So the main Hebrew uh, source uh, or manuscript source that we have um, for um, passages such as Exodus 12 is the, it's called the Leningrad Codex, which dates to about 1000 uh, AD. And that represents... Um, the passing down of the Hebrew text from the um, 
earlier Jewish scribes going back to Ezra and, and even before. Um, and of course, this later school of scribes, they were known as the Masorets. They're, they're the ones who added um, vowel pointings to the Hebrew text. So according to that tradition, um, the, the Israelites live, lived in Egypt um, for 430 years um, before the Exodus took place. If you um, subscribe to the view, uh, in this case, of the Samaritan Pentateuch and the um, the uh, uh, the, the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, um, that reading suggests that the Israelites um, lived in in Canaan and Egypt for 430 years before the Exodus. Now, it's a very long and arduous. Uh, explanation for all of this. Um, I wrote a journal article, wrote and published a journal article, uh, published it in 2019. It's available on my academia.edu webpage for free download. It represents the most thorough study on this topic ever undertaken. At least if there's a more thorough one, I've not found it or heard about it. And in there, I explain why the Masoretic text reading has to be the right reading there and why the, the reading that's in the um, uh, LXX, the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, why that reading has to be, I'm sorry, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls agree with the Masoretic text here. It's the Samaritan Pentateuch and the LXX that agree with each other. Why that reading has to be a reading that developed from the original reading that's in the Hebrew Bible. There's only one way to show, in fact, um, this is really important, time, uh, Simon. In the field of, um, of what's called lower textual criticism, where you're trying to find out which is the correct reading when, when biblical manuscripts disagree with each other, mm -hmm. the main um, uh, area of evidence, the, most, the strongest, most important area of evidence is, um, in, at least with internal evidence, it's how, how do you account for the rise of the spurious reading, the wrong reading? Can you show which which variant came from the other variant? And it's e it's usually easy to trace one way and impossible or nearly impossible to trace the other way backwards. And that's the case with this variant. So almost for sure, uh, 430, uh, 430 years represents the time that the Israelites were in Egypt alone. And my article explains in great depth the parallel passage in Galatians, and it, and it shows why Galatians 3 um, is not supporting this idea that uh, the Israelites, or yeah, that of a 430 year period from the time that Abraham was in the land all the way until the time of the Exodus. It's not saying that at all. In fact, um, it's saying that Abraham's, one of Abraham's offspring, a singular offspring from from his time, and it has to be someone who receives the covenant. Who received the covenant? Three men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was the last man to receive the covenant. He received it just as he was on the road with his family from Canaan going into Egypt. So at that moment, he received the covenant, and from that very same year, right, because that same year he, he lands in Egypt, from that year, 1876 BC, we can move forward 430 years until two events happen 430 years later in 1446. One is the Exodus, and two, according to Galatians 3, is the, um, the receiving of the law at Sinai, that site that we were looking at, um, where the Israelites um, had God's revelation for them now to live as a nation. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Petrich. And for those that want to look at that article, we've actually put a link to it in the comment section to academia.edu to Dr. Petrovich's articles there. So please do avail yourself and make sure you read that article. We're going to have to stop tonight because I've just been warned that actually we're not, sh we're not sure what happens at nine o'clock. I think we might cut out. So I just want to thank you, Dr. Petrovich, um, so much for your time. This has been um, so helpful, not just to me, I can see in the comments section, to everyone who's been watching, it's been a, a really great night. My pleasure, Simon. Thank you for the privilege of um, speaking about the things that I've poured my heart and life into. And, and I do um, 
hope that it was of great benefit to all who, who listened and heard. It, it was indeed. And we do thank you again. And so to everyone watching, we do appreciate um, you taking the time to join us tonight. And please do have a blessed weekend. So good night from me and good night from Dr. Petrovich.